This lecture is on sacral fractures. I'm going to try to focus a little bit more on the sacral fractures themselves rather than uh, those fractures typically seen in the context of pelvic ring injuries. Um, there are many slides here borrowed from the AONA faculty lecture archives, a few images taken from skeletal trauma textbook, and some from our textbook, Contemporary Management of Fractures and Complications. So this is a general outline of what we're going to follow. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about classifications, indications, fixation options, uh, and I'll try to explain sacral dysmorphism. And interspersed, we'll talk a little bit about uh, so-called atypical fractures and their management. So some of the challenges with uh, sacral fractures include the fact that you're dealing with uh, often a very compromised soft tissue envelope. Uh, you have large forces transmitted to the hardware that are fixed at very limited anatomic fixation points and then surrounded by very thin soft tissues. Um, the imaging can be very difficult uh, intraoperatively as well as preoperatively. I mean, you could need good CT scanning and um, a lot of adjunctive uh, techniques done intraoperatively to, to see what you're doing. And the reductions can not only be challenging, but they're somewhat unfamiliar. Th these are not... Uh, uh, techniques that uh, are employed on a very frequent basis, so they're unfamiliar. So classification. Um, the Denise classification is the one familiar to most orthopedic residents. has this zone 1, 2, and 3 phenomenon being lateral to the foramen through the foramina or medial to the foramina. So here you can see the uh, fracture in uh, zone 1 essentially occurring out here in zone two, it's kind of through the foramen, and then in zone three, it's anything medial to the foramen, right? Kind of through the sacral body. So atypical or so-called atypical fractures are these U-shaped, H-shaped, lambda type, T type. You know, that's one way to describe them. Sort of this anatomic, uh, morpho morpho you know, morphologic description. There is also a classification based on the sagittal imaging or lateral sacral X-ray that looks specifically at angulation and displacements. Roy Camille classification. So here, I'm going to point your attention to the top of the uh, screen. So a type one is essentially where you just have this angulation here at uh, the S1, S2 level, or somewhere in that area. Or as a type 2, you have this kyphosis, or sort of this flexion type. So here, you have to imagine the sacral nerve roots are pinched, so, or kind of kinked, and can be transected. And the problem is you can get a bilateral transection when you get one of these of everything at the S2 level and down. Uh, so it can almost cause a cauda type uh, picture in, in a bad displaced or angulated case. Now the type 3, or sort of an extension type, is also a bad actor, but in this case, you kind of sort of have this canal expanding lesion, as I've heard certain surgeons uh, put it, where the spinal canal is actually kind of widened, not necessarily in a good way, but it's certainly not uh, completely pinched off. Like if this is your, you know, the extent of your spinal canal, you can see how this spot here, um, you kind of run out of room, right? Um, so, uh, and, uh, so that's the type three. And the type four essentially is a crush injury, right, to the S1 body. So here are those sort of morphologic descriptions again: H type, U type, lambda type, T type. These are all somewhat uncommon, um, and you need to really know what you're looking for to pick up on these. Um, I mean, I've certainly seen all of these at some point, but I would say. You know, the lambda type and T types are fairly uncommon. The U type, and sometimes you get an H type, is a little bit more common in, in, in my experience. Uh, and, but the, the U type is, is, is a bad actor, and, and this is kind of the mechanism of what's going on. You essentially have a, like a spinopelvic dissociation. And this is not something that you see in most typical pelvic ring injuries where you have an SI joint in dislocation, or you may have a vertical sacral fracture or sacral impaction. Here, you kind of have this dissociation. What I tell residents are that if you ever see an axial CT where you see sort of this bilateral vertical sacral fractures, I mean, if I get a phone call saying, like, you know, I got this guy, he's got bilateral sacral ala fractures, I say, look, are you sure that you don't have something that actually connects 
and you have a U-shaped phenomenon. So you have to look at the sagittal imaging. Okay, it's critical. You have to look at the sagittal imaging or at least a lateral sacral x-ray, but typically if these patients are getting scanned, you just have to ask to make sure you get a lateral sacral or sagittal sacral view, uh, or sagittal view um, reconstructions. All right, and this is kind of showing what's going on with the spine being dissociated from the ilium and the rest of the pelvis. So surgical indications include compromised pelvic stability, right? So this is like your uh, tile type C injury, right, with some big vertical fracture through the back of the sacrum and perhaps some anterior ring injury like a vertical shear or some type of APC3 equivalent or whatever it is, um, an unstable, uh, vertically unstable pelvis. So of course, this may require surgical management. Uh, it may also just be for pain management or accelerated rehabilitation. And then there's the question of when you need to do uh, you know, surgery for nerve root compression, right? So certainly if you have you know, sort of like this uh, Roy Camille type uh, two injury here, where again, the nerve roots are trying to sort of like get caught right there. And then you have potentially bilateral nerve root injury here at the S, maybe at the S3 level and down. Um, uh, and the central canal is obliterated. Do you need to do surgery because of, you know, need to relieve the nerve roots? Well, we, we, we do know this. You kind of have this sort of five, it's a rough uh, estimate. 25 and 50, it's a good way to remember it uh, for test taking purposes um, for the Denise classification of uh, uh, incident of nerve root injury or nerve injury. Um, but the question is whether or not uh, operative management really helps. So here's Denny 3, non-operative, uh, a, lot of, a lot of them improved surgically. Here's uh, Denny 3, operative, um, and uh, some had, uh, you know, many found to have transaction, some had complete recovery. So literature suggests maybe 80% improvement whether you, you decompress or not. So displaced sacral fractures with nerve roots at risk um, can be managed if you need to, you know, deal with a fracture and you want to make sure you avoid crushing or pinching or injuring the nerves any further, you may have to do an open approach distract the sacral fracture, clean out the foramen, and then sort of in a controlled fashion, compress the fracture and make sure that you're not catching the nerve root in the middle of it. So there's numerous options for fixation. Um, iliosacral screws, uh, as shown uh, here, uh, one or two. Okay, sacral bars, as shown here. Uh, this is kind of an old school technique. Um, and another version of that is the uh, tension band plate or transiliac plate, I think is a pretty accurate way to describe that. Posterior transiliac plate. It can be combined uh, as shown here with an iliosacral screw. Uh, or you can do uh, lateral plates. This is one example here. You can also do plates that are, um, that are applied vertically. And uh, spinal pelvic fixation shown here and we'll get into a little bit later. So we'll kind of talk about a lot of these uh, techniques um, in this video. So um, uh, I'm actually going to pause right here and then we'll get into uh, iliosacral screws and then open techniques and uh, a little bit about um, uh, dysmorphism in the next lecture. Thanks.